Lou, I'd like to welcome you to this program on early childhood oral health that also serves as the required training for the Alabama Medicaid and the All Kids programs on oral health risk assessment, fluoride varnish application, and referral to a dental home. My name is Dr. Richard Simpson. I'm a pediatric dentist practicing in Tuscaloosa, Alabama, and the immediate past president of the Alabama Academy of Pediatric Dentistry. This presentation uh, is der derived primarily from two physician training programs. The first, the Smiles for Life program on child oral health from the American Academy of Family Practitioners and the oral health risk assessment training for pediatricians and other child health professionals developed earlier by the American Academy of Pediatrics. I've also incorporated a few additional slides that I have found to be helpful to further clarify key points in the training. In 2000, the U.S. Surgeon General's report on oral health emphasized that good oral health is critical and integral to the overall health and well-being of each child. It also called dental caries in children an epidemic with significant health and socioeconomic consequences and recognized the substantial research and literature that supports early access and intervention as keys to prevention. Pediatricians, family practitioners, and other uh, health care providers for children can have a major impact on health outcomes for children because of the opportunities for early intervention. They see children early and regularly in their first couple of years of life. <coughs> Pediatricians and family practitioners are experts in providing anticipatory guidance, parental education, and prevention strategies. Much of what's discussed during well child visits has an impact on oral health as well to include things such as nutrition, feeding habits, fluoride sources, and trauma prevention. What we want to do is add additional skills to your repertoire in recognizing early oral disease, providing preventive measures, and emphasizing the importance of referral to a dental home. Pediatricians and other health care providers can advocate for children's health issues and oral health as a part of overall health. In 2003, the American Academy of Pediatrics released an oral health policy statement entitled Oral Health Risk Assessment Timing and the Establishment of a Dental Home. The AAP has since updated this twice. Currently, the American Academy of Pediatrics, the American Academy of Family Practitioners, the American Dental Association, the American Academy of Pediatric Dentistry, and the Academy of General Dentistry all now recommend a risk assessment be performed by six months of age and that each child have a dental home within six months of the eruption of the first tooth and no later than 12 months of age. So what does a risk assess assessment entail? Well, later on in this presentation, we will go over in detail uh, a caries risk assessment tool uh, in chart form uh, that simplifies uh, things for the practitioner. But in essence, a risk assessment involves discussing and evaluating a mother or a caregiver's oral health assessing the oral health risk of the infants and the children, and we will give you a, uh, an indication of what those various risks are, recognizing the signs and symptoms of dental caries and the earliest stage of caries development, assessing uh, what exposures the child may have to fluorides, uh, providing anticipatory guidance and oral hygiene instruction, as well as making a timely referral to a dental home. So in addition to covering in more detail oral health risk assessment, we will also talk about each of the following. Uh, with a special emphasis on ages 0 th to 3 and early childhood caries. So let's talk about early childhood caries. What is early childhood caries? Well, it is an infectious, transmissible disease, chronic disease, just that destroys tooth structure, can lead to pain, loss of function, difficulty in eating, uh, and subsequent infections. It is not inherited. Uh, you oftentimes will hear, well, I'm just, my child inherited bad teeth, or I inherited bad teeth from my parents. It is not an inherited disorder, although there are rare genetic disorders. It is a transmissible disease caused by bacteria. Um, a variety of feeding habits are one of the most critical aspects of prevention or causing uh, caries, and we'll go over those in great detail. It's no longer called baby bottle tooth decay, although you'll still s sometimes hear that. You do not have to have a bottle to develop this severe type of caries. And it affects uh, as much as 35% of three-year-olds from low-income families. One in three three-year-olds, therefore, in Alabama uh, and lower-income families have active dental caries. These are the kids that you're seeing every day in your practices, uh, enrolled in all kids, enrolled in uh, Medicaid, and this is a preventable disease. And in some areas of the state of Alabama, we know the prevalence to be beyond 30 to 35 percent, as much as 50 percent or more. 
Early childhood caries is the most chronic common disease of childhood, and it's five times more common than asthma. As we said, 30 to 50 percent of low-income children will have this disease. Um, two to five-year-olds, unfortunately, we're seeing an increase in, the, in this disease. So over the last 50 to 60 years, nationally, there has been a decline in the incidence or prevalence of dental caries. But the, for the very youngest children, we now see that uh, there has been an increase from 24 percent to 28 percent over a 10-year period in the last studies. And that is a 17 percent increase in the incidence of caries in children of this age. Uh, there's the 80-20 rule that many people are familiar with and that 80% of dental decay is in 20% of children and that has a lot to do with various factors that we'll cover including socioeconomic status, education level, um, nutrition and that sort of thing. Uh, here are some additional points that um, we do know about uh, caries in the youngest children. 80% um, of teeth uh, will go untreated if a child is living in poverty. Now in the state of Alabama, I know we've made some significant inroads with the various programs that we've implemented and through All Kids and through Medicaid, but due to a variety of uh, reasons, due to access, due to education, we know that most children that have decay uh, will not receive all the care that they need. Um, children that develop decay at a very young age will de continue to develop decay at a rate more than twice as fast as children that have not developed decay by age uh, three. So our focus wants to, uh, uh, is, needs to be in an area where we are trying to get our children to age three as caries free. We also know that caries at a very early age uh, is more aggressive. Uh, the bacteria are more virulent. It progresses more uh, rapidly and can lead to multiple complications at a very early age that can affect their development. So this is a Venn diagram uh, that demonstrates the multifactorial aspects of the development of dental caries. Now, simply stated, you have to have a susceptible tooth exposed to a pathogenic bacteria in the presence of a substrate, most commonly simple sugars. But there are many variables uh, involved in each of these three components. Uh, for instance, with the tooth. How mature is the tooth? When teeth first erupt in the mouth, they are not, the enamel is not as mature as it will be later on. It incorporates uh, fluoride in particular and other minerals uh, and strengthens over time. What are the fluoride components in the tooth? How much fluoride does that tooth have in the enamel to provide resistance? What's the morphology of the tooth? Some teeth are, are more susceptible to decay than others due to anatomy. For instance, the grooves and pits of the chewing surfaces of the teeth. Um, the uh, tooth, if it has developmental defects, it will show in just a little while. Uh, also, the location of the tooth. Uh, teeth on the lower uh, anterior are much less susceptible to decay because of the saliva flow and the tongue protection versus those in the, in the upper anterior. And then uh, also nutrition. As the, as the infant was developing, were they premature? Did they have uh, nutritional stresses that caused defects to develop in the teeth as they, as they were forming? Uh, in regards to the bacteria, uh, the strep mutans is the primary uh, bacteria causing decay. Um, but how much strep mutans is there in the mouth? Uh, how virulent is it? Uh, do we have fluoride being exposed onto the teeth on a daily basis? These bacteria do not like fluoride. Fluoride in the, in the plaque that forms on the teeth inhibits the ability for the um, bacteria uh, to utilize the uh, substrate or the sugars and uh, process those and release the acid. Um, so there's, there's, there's variables related to the bacteria as well. And then the substrate. Uh, what is the saliva flow like? How long is the sugar in the mouth? How often is the sugar in the mouth? Um, and the hygiene of the, uh, uh, in the mouth. Um, then how often are they getting exposures to the types of sugars that can cause these problems? And what we do know is that the bacteria uh, are acidogenic. They, they like acid and they produce acid. So we can change the makeup of the oral flora prior to age three significantly simply by reducing the, the amount of bacteria that are in the mouth through good hygiene. Um, reducing the frequent exposures to the substrates um, and creating an environment that's, as we talk about with the parents, that's friendly for the good bugs and not friendly for the bad bugs. Let's talk a little bit more about the bacteria. Again, it's the strep mutans. Um, and these are, as we mentioned earlier, 
uh, this is a transferable disease. It's a, it's transmis uh, uh, it's a transmission type disease uh, from primary caregivers, usually the mother, uh, but they can also have, uh, which would be a vertical transmission, but they can also have lateral transmission from siblings. And that's why we know that uh, younger children that have older siblings that had a high incidence of caries, uh, again, it's not inherited, but they catch the bugs from mom, they catch the bugs from, from their older siblings. Um, and it's usually through saliva contact. You know, mom's uh, saliva solves everything. So pacifier goes on the ground, you lick it off, it's clean, stick it in the mouth. Uh, you test food, you, um, you know, you test food, lick it. Um, you know, we see all the time pictures of moms uh, nursing their child and the fingers are in mom's mouth. So we're going we're gonna to kiss our babies, we're going to transmit the bacteria. So that's why it's so important for moms to be involved in this process as well. Uh, the higher bacterial level in the caregiver's mouth, again, is the more likely the child will become colonized. So when we're talking to parents about preventing decay in their child, when it's very obvious that this parent has significant uh, you know, issues for needing oral care as well, we need to involve her in that process. She may not be able to seek comprehensive care, but there are some things that she can do to improve um, her oral health in a way that will reduce the transmission of uh, germs to the child. Uh, we also know that with uh, children receiving uh, uh, early exposures, um, again, what we mentioned is that the less frequently we expose to the sugars, the less bacteria we have maintaining good oral hygiene, the less bacteria we have uh, applications of professional fluorides and daily exposures to fluoride water and fluoride toothpaste also will reduce the bacterial count because we, what we're trying to do is create an oral environment that's less favorable for strep mutans. Now let's talk about the sugars or the substrate. And this chart um, is a great illustration of what we see, unfortunately, so much these days with children. And we really, uh, the research and, and our experience is that the increase in very young children I think is a direct correlation to the change in dietary habits that we have for children these days. Uh, it's rare that you see a child walking around with a sippy cup with water. It's usually juice or Kool-Aid or, or other types of drinks. And um, so we can kind of go through this little scenario here where we have an infant wake up, they're in a safe zone. It's all about pH. Um, our, every day we eat and drink. And what happens is then um, with the, the bacteria that we have in our mouth utilizing the carbohydrates, they release acid. Our pH drops below a certain point. Our teeth actually lose minerals for a little while. Then our saliva um, uh, washes this out. It dilutes the acids and we recover. And this is something we all experience on a daily basis. It's where we have too much time below that safe zone in the pH that it becomes an issue. And this is what we're seeing so often with the very young children. So they get up, they have a bottle, and we're in the danger zone, we're losing minerals from the teeth. And we can remineralize on a regular basis from our saliva, but we, if, if we lose more minerals than we gain, that's the key. So we've recovered, we're back in a safe zone, then we have breakfast. And then we recover, we're back in the safe zone again, and then we have a snack. And then we're in a sippy cup the rest of the morning, um, and then we, get, we finally make it to a safe zone and we're back to lunch. And that's just the first six hours. So at, in my office, one of the things that I discuss with the parents is that, that basically we have the germs that cause, back, uh, the, cause decay in our mouths um, and every time they're exposed to sugars, they release acid. And this acid causes loss of minerals of the teeth. And so every time that your child takes the cup and touches it to their mouth with juice, or any of those other drinks, it's like dumping all their teeth in a cup of acid for 40 minutes because that's the approximate time that this is released from the bacteria. So, I, and then I emphasize that. One sip, 40 minutes of acid on your teeth. Another sip, 40 minutes of acid on your teeth. And you start to see them kind of calculating how many times that child is getting these things in their mouth. And it can have a big impact on them when you're getting in there early and explaining these sorts of things. So what we've got to do is reduce these in-between meal exposures and reduce the time that we're in the danger zone for um, developing decay. In regards to breastfeeding, the American Academy of Pediatric Dentistry, uh, just like the American Academy of Pediatrics, are strong supporters of breastfeeding. And breast, breast milk in and of itself um, has not been shown to be cariogenic. However, when we reach a point where we've added other components to a diet for a child, uh, when we start introducing foods and other types of drinks, then we have more frequent exposures of fermentable carbohydrates for the bacteria. And so if we're still breastfeeding, then we have to be cautious about those other exposures. Um, and we have to be cautious about the frequency of at-will breastfeeding, particularly at night. So key 
key aspects of that is if you, if, if, uh, you do have a mom that's nursing well into uh, age one and beyond, we want to make sure that they have a dental home so that we can be watching for those things that we need to watch for. Two, we want to make sure that you're emphasizing that if they cleanse the mouth before they go to bed. Uh, and three, really focus on the in-between meal exposures of other things such as juices and other types of drinks. Now, let's talk about, uh, again, the teeth briefly. Now, uh, we, we mentioned the location of the teeth is important, the morphology of the teeth is important, uh, the uh, mineral component of the teeth uh, is important, and how much fluoride they're exposed to. And then there are the, the aspects of defects. Uh, some studies show as much as 20 to 40 percent of children have some enamel defects in their teeth, and there's a variety of reasons for this. Uh, sometimes the teeth erupt and, and they've got developmental defects and we really don't know why. There are rare inherited disorders that can uh, cause enamel problems. Um, the stresses of birth have actually been caused because we can see chronologically um, certain teeth that developed at certain times where these defects are. Uh, nutritional stresses early on, kids that have been in the NICU, that sort of thing, um, can have more defects on the teeth. That automatically makes those teeth much more susceptible to decay because the enamel is not as thick. Uh, it may be uh, the surface uh, uh, aspect of it may be rough enough that uh, bacteria can harbor on that uh, easier. Um, so what we're looking for is not only uh, the shape and form of the teeth, but we want to identify any defects that may be located there. This slide here uh, is, demonstrates what we're looking for in healthy teeth. The ideal is we like to see the spacing here, and I always tell the parents that they're worried about the spaces. I said, no, 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 we want baby teeth to look like a picket fence. When they don't look like a picket fence and they're tight, we not only know that they're going to be crowded when the permanent teeth come in, um, but also it makes it more challenging to keep the teeth clean because this is basically self-cleansing in between the teeth if we're doing uh, uh, regular brushing. So baby teeth also seem to have, uh, for the most part, a single shade or color. They're, they're basically an opaque white throughout. Um, that's why a lot of parents, when the permanent teeth come in, get kind of panicked that they're yellow, but there's a transitional um, uh, shade uh, differential on those teeth versus just the solid white. Um, and we should see uh, nice, tight, uh, pinkish gums against the teeth. Now, what we're looking for very early on when we're doing an oral exam in the development of decay is changes in color and, uh, and, and patterns, not just holes. I always describe to parents that, uh, that decay, dental decay, is not holes. It's not cavities. Cavities is a consequence of the process. Decay is a process. It is the loss of minerals from the tooth structure um, and that's not remineralizing. As we mentioned, the more loss we have, the more frequently we're losing minerals, then we start to see the breakdown. So what we usually are seeing are these white lines right along the gum line here because plaque first develops at the gum line. So this is one of the, what I call warning signs with the parents. I said, when we see these white lines, and a lot of times we'll see a little redness in the gum tissue, I said, two things going on. Gingivitis, because we're leaving plaque along the gum line and the body's trying to fight the germs, but at the same time, each time that plaque is exposed to food and drink, there's a release of acid. And if we were to look at this underneath the microscope, the surface is intact, but underneath it starts to look like a sponge. We're losing minerals from under the tooth surface, and by the time it reaches this point, we could have 30 to 40 percent of the minerals lost out from under that. And then what happens, it begins to cavitate. As it weakens, then it breaks down. Now we're at a stage right here where we can actually remineralize and stop the process by making those changes at home and professional applications of things such as fluoride varnish. Now when you see this, you immediately categorize that child as a high risk for dental decay and that's one of the very first things you need to, to, to decide is in, in recommend, demonstrating to the parent and recommending getting to a dental home. And for the programs that we're going to be talking about in just a little while, this is one of the uh, uh, factors that when you categorize it at a high risk, application of fluoride varnish is very appropriate. Then we start to see a progression of decay. And I always tell my pediatrician friends, look behind the teeth because a lot of times we'll see the front surface of the tooth or the labial aspect intact or maybe just the little white lines and we look behind and we've got these large craters here. And these teeth are not very thick so that does not have very far to go before it starts to involve the pulp or the nerve and blood supply of the tooth. So we've gone from the, the white discolorations to now the cavitations as those begin to break down. 
a lot of times when we see these children at this early stage, even though this is fairly significant decay, because of some of the uh, restorative materials that we have uh, that bond to the tooth and release fluoride, we're able to scoop a lot of that decay out without even having to use a handpiece, um, apply a uh, bonding agent, and then re and transitionally restore these teeth with a fluoride releasing uh, um, uh, restorative material that can buy them a couple of years until they reach a point where they're four or five and capable of helping us out in the office to do a more definitive type restoration. So getting them to the dentist early on, getting these transitional restorations placed if the, if, if the dentist feels it's appropriate, and at the same time starting to get the, the uh, fluoride varnish applications and making those dietary and hygiene uh, uh, changes at home can go a long ways to preventing more devastating uh, decay. This, unfortunately, uh, we see every week in our office, and, and my pediatric dentist uh, colleagues and general dentists across the state see it as well, and a lot of the pediatricians are seeing this. Um, this is only a 10-month-old, and those two teeth, uh, if you were to touch them, would actually bend back and forth. I don't mean the tooth moving. I mean that tooth actually is bending. It's that soft. So by the time you excavate the caries out, there's really nothing to restore. So we've got a 10-month-old that's getting ready to have to have two teeth extracted. Um, so this is urgent because these children begin to start feeling pain and they can't even define to you what they're feeling. They don't, they don't know what, how they're supposed to feel. So, so they, they, they get to the point where they're hurting. Um, on this slide here, there's actually a local abscess that's already developed uh, on an 18-month-old. And there's a lot of us across the state that every week uh, we're in the hospital uh, treating children like this under general anesthesia to get them caught up and in, in good health again. Um, this is a, a further uh, demonstration of how extensive the decay be can be. Uh, these are decayed down into the pulps. You can actually see the, the red pulp in that area. Uh, we have a large abscess here. Uh, and then actually over here it's a little difficult to see as a draining abscess from that tooth there. So, um, you know, when, when you hear, well, I'm not going to worry about my baby's teeth because they're going to fall out anyway. Well, there's the same blood supply that goes through baby teeth and goes through the permanent teeth. The same blood supply that goes to every part of our body goes through these teeth and they have nerves, they have blood supply, and the earliest they're going to be losing these anterior teeth um, on average is five to seven years of age. The earliest they're going to lose the cuspids and the posterior teeth is anywhere from 10 to 12, sometimes 14 years of age. Um, so harboring that type of, of, of disease process in the mouth we know is not uh, something that we want to do and not wait until they just fall out. We see the consequences of that every week. And the order of progression. Now, there, there, this varies from child to child. Uh, you're going to see exceptions to the rule. but. Most of the time, what you're going to see, what used to be, again, called baby bottle tooth decay, what we call early childhood caries, the worst decay is going to be up on the upper anterior. And that's for a couple of reasons. First of all, those are some of the first teeth that are in. The lower anterior is protected by the saliva and the tongue more commonly. If you see the caries down there, you've got a real problem because these are usually the very last ones to decay. Also, because we will see the kids with the sippy cups all the time, when you actually see how that's held in the mouth, the, the materials from the cup uh, are held against the teeth by the tongue. A lot of times they're using this cup as a pacifier and not as a source of fluid. So if it's water, it's not a problem. But any other substrates there that have, that, uh, have carbohydrates um, can lead to this rapid breakdown. And so the tongue is actually holding this material against the teeth. Um, and then it begins to move posteriorly. Um, so a lot of times by the time we see them at one and a half, we have upper front four and then all four first molars are badly decayed. Well, what can this type of problem lead to? Well, we know that it can cause very significant pain for the children. Um, and unfortunately, the younger children really can't, as we mentioned, can't relate to their preschool teachers or their parents that they're hurting. We usually just see behavioral changes. Um, you may see a, a you know, decreased uh, desire to participate in activities. Um, you may see a, a decline in production in school. Um, spread of infection. Uh, this child is actually uh, experiencing a cellulitis. Um, and probably by the end of the day or maybe by the next day it's possible the eye could start swelling closed. So you can go from the local abscess that we showed earlier to a facial cellulitis. In rare cases you can develop such things as Ludwig's angina that can affect their airway. I'm sure many of you heard the story of um, uh, the child in the Northeast that died from a brain abscess um, due to a, a dental infection. Now uh, granted that's very rare but um, we do know it can affect their health and, and the spread of infection is obviously not a long-term 
long-term um, thing that we want to have going on with their health. Um, it can lead to difficulty in eating and failure to thrive. There is actually some studies that uh, evaluated children um, and they looked at children that had to have a dental rehab uh, where we completely restore their mouth, uh, get rid of all the decay issues uh, in the operating room. And they took these children uh, and compared them to children that uh, were on the same point on the height weight scale uh, on the growth chart that had no caries. And then they compared them several months after they had had the ones that had the dental rehab and quite a few of those were actually higher on the growth charts than the other children that did not have caries. And what this was showing is that significant dental caries was actually impacting the child's genetic potential for growth. And once they were treated and cared for and, and restored to a, a healthy oral environment, they were actually able to start having catch-up growth. So we know it affects their overall health. Um, now, when we talk about it increases their risk of dental decay in adult teeth, there's quite often a misunderstanding that if I've got a cavity in a baby tooth, it's going to go through the baby tooth down into the permanent tooth that's underneath and cause it to decay. Decay cannot develop until the tooth is in the mouth and exposed to the bacteria. Now, an abscessed tooth or a chronically inflamed tooth can, can have an impact on the developing permanent tooth and how it forms. It can cause it to be weaker. It can have defects. But what this means here is if we have an oral environment that we talked about that's high in strep mutans, that's acidogenic, that's a high acid type oral environment, then when the permanent teeth come in, they have more bacteria that can cause decay and the whole oral environment is set up to cause more cavities on the permanent teeth just like the baby teeth. And of course, if we have significant decay, we can have teeth shifting and um, bite uh, effects and that sort of thing that can lead to a variety of malocclusions. Beyond just the health issues, we know that um, uh, it can have a huge impact on school performance. Uh, there was a study that estimated that 51 million school days were lost uh, each year on average due to uh, dental problems. That's, that's an impact on society. Um, it can affect their speech. Um, if, if they have to have multiple teeth removed at a very early age, that can definitely expect, affect their uh, speech development. Um, obviously, in, inability to concentrate in school and perform uh, appropriately. There's self-esteem issues. Uh, kids can be rough to other kids, and if they have multiple cavities in the anterior that are very obvious, um, that can be an issue. Um, if they're missing teeth that had to be extracted, that can be an issue. Um, and then just a confidence level from a lot of these kids. Um, and then uh, we can lead to, you know, it has obviously systemic uh, consequences, particularly for children with special health care needs. What we've got to do, why is all this important? What we're trying to emphasize is we've got to find these high-risk kids early and intervene early so that we can prevent these type of problems from developing further down the road and determine when they need to get to the dentist, how much fluoride exposure they need, do they need supplemental uh, fluoride uh, topical exposures, uh, do we need to alter their nutritional uh, counseling and that sort of thing. Let's talk a little bit more about high-risk groups. Who are these high-risk children? Well, um, first of all, any child with special health care needs, um, whether it be developmental issues, whether it be um, significant health issues, uh, for a variety of reasons. Um, and we'll go over that in more detail in just a minute. But uh, first of all, the parents are preoccupied with a lot of other health issues. So the mouth kind of takes a, second, a back seat uh, quite often. Um, the medications or the, the actual specifics of, of immunity or other types of problems that they may have uh, can have an impact on, on, on the oral environment and the development of oral problems. Um, also, uh, some of the developmental kids or, or uh, developmentally challenged kids are very challenging to provide adequate oral hygiene to. Uh, and so there's some hints that, that the dentist can review on, on uh, how to take care of their mouths. Um, children from low socioeconomic status and certain uh, ethno and cultural groups are at higher risk. Children with uh, a lack of exposure or adequate exposure to fluorides. Uh, the most um, important benefit that we see is the topical benefit um, and most commonly that's from fluoridated water as well as um, we do get some systemic benefit from that and then also the fluoride toothpaste and then professional applications of fluoride. Um, so children that are on well water and don't get their teeth brushed with fluoride toothpaste and, and have not received any professional applications are at higher risk. Um, poor dietary habits, as we mentioned, um, are, are uh, vital uh, aspects of, of leading to decay. 
And then we, as we mentioned also, caregivers, parents, uh, siblings that, uh, that have had a high incidence of decay, uh, their siblings or their children are at a higher risk as well. And then any child, obviously, when you're looking at them that has already evidence of caries is at high risk. Now, briefly on the special health care needs uh, children. Uh, as we mentioned, the, the medical conditions can lead to issues, uh, making it more challenging to care for their teeth. Uh, multiple medications can have an, asp uh, an impact not only from the frequent applications of oral medications um, that are quite often sweetened, but also there are certain medications that can cause drying of, um, of the mouth or reduction in saliva flow, which means that we have a longer period of time of acid on the teeth. Um, developmental defects in the teeth uh, on significantly compromised patients. Sometimes the teeth come in um, uh, with sig significant defects on them. Um, and then uh, certain children um, that have dietary restrictions, um, then they may be getting some supplementation and the pediatrician may choose to do that through juices and other types of exposures. Uh, and so then that can increase their uh, carry susceptibility as well. And as we mentioned earlier, children that are on multiple uh, asthma and, uh, or certain asthma medications and, and allergy medications may have decreased saliva flow. Also, the breathing treatments uh, that are done quite often right before bed can uh, cause um, more acid exposures to the mouth. And so we want to be able to, you know, see if we can get that, you know, a little earlier in the evening or, you know, 45 minutes to an hour before bed and then have them rinse out with water. So we know that those children are a little bit more susceptible. L again, low, low birth weight babies, um, preemies, um, often have defects on their teeth. And then we have the reverse component of if we have very poor oral health, that can affect some of the complicating medical conditions that we have, whether it be heart conditions um, or uh, immune disorders. If, if we're trying to fight oral infections on a chronic basis and you don't have the immunity to be able to do it, then that can obviously cause significant problems. And then we're also working with uh, children and, and uh, children's hospital and other pediatricians. When we have children that have to receive treatment for significant medical compromising conditions and the oral poor oral health is preventing that treatment from being able to be provided. Um, so that's why we've got to work so closely in, in preventing uh, this and work in, in uh, rehabbing them before they receive that care. Again, socioeconomic factors. Uh, the uh, lower income families uh, in a lot of uh, areas may not have the adequate insurance that they need. Um, thankfully, we have a, you know, kids that uh, are covered by all kids, covered by um, uh, Medicaid in the state. But uh, we, again, have moms that uh, do not have uh, adequate dental insurance, and so their oral health may suffer as a consequence. Uh, there's a low education level, most commonly, um, and so the understanding of the process of decay, of disease prevention, of the importance of maintaining good hygiene and good oral health uh, is definitely a factor. Um, uh, access to transportation, access to facilities in the area, um, you know, or not having facilities in the area. If you're in a, in a rural community, there may be only one or two dentists for the entire county. Certain cultural aspects um, and, and uh, ethnic groups. Uh, we know that Native Americans have the highest caries rate of anyone. Um, uh, as much as 75% of children have caries uh, in Native American populations. Uh, we know that there's a disproportionate um, uh, caries prevalence in uh, Hispanics and African Americans, even uh, taking out uh, the aspect of low income. Uh, and then dietary practices and, and feeding practices. Um, there are certain, you know, populations, certain uh, even families, if they're close, you know, they live cl very close together in tight-knit groups, if they have a uh, tradition of honestly pre-chewing pre food and then giving it to the child, there's certain groups that do that. Um, first time I saw that in my residency program, I turned right back out of the cafe and decided I wasn't eating lunch then. But, um, uh, I hear it uh, quite often from some of the rural areas in, in Alabama when a child is colicky, uh, you give them sugar water and that actually can, can calm the child down but obviously lead to a whole variety of other issues. So some of the, you know, the family um, uh, traditions uh, can be an issue as well in, in cultural environments. Uh, some Hispanic uh, populations have a, a much higher acid uh, type uh, diet. And so we just need to be aware of that and uh, we're involved in counseling. Okay, so you've decided, all right, I get it. It's important that we evaluate a child, that we do a thorough oral examination and we do a risk assessment. So what is that going to actually entail?
Um, one of the things um, I want to kind of cover here too is the way we work our workflow in the office. Uh, we determined that one of the best ways to make sure that we were capturing at least every child once was to make sure that this was a routine part of the nine-month checkup. And so we do it on every nine-month-old. A lot of our children make it to the dentist by the time they're one. And so we don't have to worry as much about our older kids, um, although it is um, totally okay to do the fluoride varnish up to 36 months of age. We were finding that to stock all of our rooms was really expensive and we were not going through enough fluoride varnish fast enough to use it before it expired. And so we have a central location where we put our fluoride varnish and then that way it gets under the patient's chart as it goes to the room instead of being stocked in the rooms. Um, you can get um, your mirrors and your varnish from um, any of the medical reps, Patterson Dental, HenryShine.com, and uh, McKesson, the dental rep, not the medical rep. Um, and you'll probably want to experiment with pricing. Um, this whole pack right here costs about a dollar, a dollar fifty. Our nurses take them out of the box, put them in little sandwich Ziploc baggies, a little snack bag so that they can be clipped to the chart to be put in the room. And that way it's all together. You also want to have some gloves, which everybody should have in their doctor's office. Um, and then the gauze for drying the teeth. Um, and that's, that's a 50-50. What you've seen so far is, um, the gauze help you kind of keep a position on the mouth and they can help dry the teeth so that the application goes better. But sometimes that may not happen, like the last time we were working with kid, with a child's teeth um, and he opened his mouth really well and we just painted him. Um, or other times you um, may have very limited opportunity, very um, tight time constraints while you have a happy child. Now, um, one of the things you want to have is if you don't have an EMR template, you want to have uh, your questionnaire, your oral health risk assessment, Medicaid requires that this be filled out. Um, we um, want to make sure that we ask all of our good questions. Now, have you had any cavities before? Yes. All right. And do you have a dentist? Do you yeah. go see the dentist? I do. Okay. All right. And you're a big guy, so you're probably all on sippy cups and cups now, aren't you? You haven't used a bottle in a long time. That's for your baby brother. And let's see, you're a healthy young man, and you don't have any special health care needs. And do, when you drink water, does your water come from the tap? Tap water? That's really good. It's got fluoride in it. It helps make your teeth nice and strong. All right. We haven't varnished your teeth before. And you brush your teethies. You scrub real good. Mom and Dad should get in there once or twice a day to help really scrub those teeth, especially before bedtime, okay? All right. And if you'll have him turn around and face you, and his legs can go on either side of you, and then he's going to lay his head straight back into my lap. Okay. All right, here we go. And you sit close to mom. And then we're just going to lay straight back this way, okay? okay? Here we go. Awesome. You did great. I'm going to have you lick my mirror, okay? Licking this mirror makes it not fog up so bad, okay? So we're just going to lick the mirror. And then we're going to get in here and take a look. Open. Uh, Open. Uh. Oh, nice. Look at those beautiful teethies. <laughs> And if you have an extra set of hands or a room where you can put things down next to you, you can use your flashlight while you're looking too. But we got such good light in this room, I'm getting a really good view. Beautiful teeth. Those are gorgeous. Plenty of good spacing. You've done a nice job, young man. These are gorgeous teethies. Real quick, here we go. Go and paint the top teethies. We want to get back here and get these molars since we've got time. Especially in these older kids, the closer to three, the more molars they have, obviously, but they also are more likely to get food caught in those molars. We want to make sure that those are nice and well protected. You are doing an awesome job. You're going to make every pediatrician think <laughs> that everybody is supposed to do this perfectly like you do. Man, you are awesome. Very good, you did great. Uh, for billing, once you get certified and Medicaid has checked you off and said that you are capable of doing this now, um, that'll open up the V72.2 code and then you bill the D1206 and the D0145. The D0145 can only be billed one time. That's for the initial oral exam. And then subsequently you can do the varnish every three months up to three times in a calendar year to help protect kids' teeth until they go to the dentist. We're going to be filling out uh, as part of the program um, an assessment, a risk assessment, and determining if the child is high or low risk. Now this was originally developed by American Academy of Pediatric Dentistry and adopted by the AAP, but the AAP has gone to a newer one that I really like better. I think this got a little bit too complicated with, well, are they moderate risk or high risk? Are they moderate risk or low risk? 
Um, not having the moderate factor there, I think, has helped a lot. Um, and so now what the AAP is using, is it was developed jointly with a variety of organizations, um, is this carries risk assessment tool or the, what they call the oral health risk assessment tool. And you'll see that it has not only risk factors, but also what your findings are and protective factors. And you can have your staff uh, fill the majority of this out before you do the exam. Uh, for instance, things we've talked about. Um, has the mom had problem, tooth problems? Does she have obvious decay? And it doesn't mean you have to go in and examine the mother's mouth, but you can ask her, have you had cavities recently? Have you had any problems? Um, do you have a regular dentist that you see? Um, what is the child's feeding habits? Or do they frequently sit between meals with a sippy cup other than water? Do they get exposures to things like juices or chocolate milk at nighttime as opposed to just water at night, which is what we really want to emphasize? Uh, snacking habits between meals. Um, are we getting a lot of sticky substances and that sort of thing? Uh, are they frequently snacking on sweet snacks? Um, are they a special, do they have special health care needs? Um, then yes. And um, are they on Medicaid? Yes. Um, and the reason we have are they on Medicaid is because we know, again, 80% of decay is in 20% of the children. The majority of those are low socioeconomic status, which means the majority of those are going to be on Medicaid or a similar program. Now, in the programs uh, for the state of Alabama, um, just being on Medicaid does not make them a high risk to where you can be reimbursed for the application of the fluoride varnish. You have to have one more factor. But that, really on the majority of these kids, that's not too hard to find because you're, in most of them, you may, you're going to see heavy plaque. You may see the crowding. You may have an older sibling that has decay. You may see the white spots. And so one more factor in addition to being on Medicaid makes them a high risk. Protective factors. Has, is the child already in a dental home? Um, that, is a, that is a protective factor and then you emphasize we want to encourage you to continue to see that dentist on a regular basis. Are they in a fluoridated community? Um, are they using a fluoride toothpaste? Um, have they received fluoride application of varnish in the, in the last several months? Um, and most importantly, is the mom brushing their teeth on a regular basis? Because a lot of times I'll ask the mom, are you, you know, you're, you're brushing their teeth? And they say, well, they do it themselves. And, and when they're two, probably not doing a very good job. As a matter of fact, every study is you know, shows that. And one of the things that, and I borrowed this from a colleague, I can't claim it, is that when you're ready for your child to clean your kitchen by themselves unsupervised, then you're ready for them to clean their teeth by themselves and unsupervised. So at a minimum, six to seven, okay? Um, now, we do encourage them to participate, particularly by the time they're two or three, because it's, it can be a family thing. Um, but uh, most of the time before three, it's a struggle. And, and uh, we'd rather them struggle with brushing than struggle with, with pain and, and infection. So this is what you're going to be filling out and identifying whether they're high risk or, or low risk. Um, because as you add all that up, um, you indicate whether they're high or low, and then you're going to indicate also whether they received anticipatory guidance, which is required in the, in the, in the, the two programs here in the state, where you've talked to them about prevention, you've talked to them about diet and how to brush and that sort of thing, whether you apply to fluoride varnish, and whether you've given a dental referral. And it is required that you give a dental referral if you've applied the fluoride varnish and billed for it. So, Let's talk a little bit more about the prevention. We've covered it, um, you know, across the, the, the presentation here, but there are four key components. Fluoride, hygiene, diet, and a ref dental referral. Again, uh, why are we presenting this to you? Why is it so important? Well, by the time you get them to us, most of the time you will have seen this child four to eight times. Um, and, and so you have a tremendous ability to have a very big impact on early intervention, early prevention, emphasizing to the parents the importance of this, and they have a trusting relationship with you. When I've, I've spoken to many pediatricians that have incorporated this program into their practice, and they said, you know, Rick, when, when uh, I've got that child laying back, doing a lap exam, focusing on the oral cavity and talking to them about preventing decay, it becomes very apparent to them that it is important to me and it's important to their child and it becomes important to them. And so that's why it, it's, you can have such a huge impact early on, not just the practical application of, of education, but just showing the emphasis and, and the need. So the anticipatory guidance, we, again, we want to minimize the risk of, of infection. And what we mean by that is the transmission of the bacteria, the strep mutans. We want to do the things working with mom to reduce uh, that transmission. We want to optimize the oral hygiene in the child's mouth and the parent's mouth. We want to reduce the frequency of exposures uh, to the sugars. Uh, we want to treat uh, and remove any existing decay. 
and then apply uh, fluoride as appropriate. In minimizing the risk for infection, uh, we want to address, first of all, the mother. And a lot of studies um, show that the, the ideal time to really do this is, is, is prenatal counseling. Um, and uh, there are plenty of programs and information out there about saying, you know, Mom, we want you in the best health possible. Yes, you can get dental care when you're pregnant. We encourage that. Um, uh, not only is it important for your overall health, but it's also important for your infant's health. Uh, significant periodontal disease um, has been a factor in, uh, in increasing the chance of premature birth. Um, and then if the mom has very poor oral hygiene and then is transferring these bugs to the child by the time the first tooth comes in the mouth, um, then we know we've missed an, a window of opportunity there. Um, and then we want to explain to them how this all develops and, and how they can prevent it. Uh, we want the parent to demonstrate a model of, of good behavior. Kids watch their, their parents. When they watch them brush their teeth, they're more inclined to want to do that as well. And then xylitol gum could very well be a significant uh, component in helping with this. They're still doing a good deal of research, but xylitol in and of itself has been shown to impact the ability of strep mutans to process the sugars and release acid. It crosses the cell wall, um, it reduces their ability to process the sugars, and long term, if there's adequate exposures to the xylitol, it can potentially reduce the, the actual bacterial count in the mouth as well. Um, and so recommending xylitol gum, I do it for parents when the kids are old enough to chew gum, when I'm giving them alternatives, so I'm saying, well, we really don't need these type of treats, but we can have sugarless gum with xylitol after a meal or a snack uh, or a drink. Uh, in addition to drinking plenty of water. And having the, the mom with good oral hygiene, using a fluoride toothpaste, and, and potentially chewing gum three to four times a day with xylitol uh, can be a big, big help for her. Now, how does fluoride have a, a, of an impact? Fluoride is um, extremely helpful in a variety of ways. First of all, uh, as we talked about with the demineralization of the tooth. Um, fluoride is incorporated into the enamel structure of the tooth. And so when the acids are exposed each and every time we eat uh, or have a drink with any type of sugars in it, then we have this demineralization. But they're more resistant. The enamel is more resistant to that when there's adequate fluoride in the enamel. Um, it enhances remineralization. So as the minerals come out and they can go back in again, um, then we're, we can reincorporate fluoride into the tooth structure. This is one that many people aren't aware of, but it actually inhibits the, the metabolism of the bacteria, the strep mutans. Earlier I mentioned that if we have even plaque that has uh, fluoride in it, uh, it, it, it inhibits the ability of, of the uh, bacteria to um, metabolize or process uh, the sugars. And so that's why we don't have to do an extensive cleaning of a one-year-old's mouth before we apply the fluoride varnish. We just wipe the teeth off and apply the fluoride varnish, and it works through the plaque. Um, and then there's the systemic effects. Um, those are not the greatest benefit, uh, we now know. But um, as uh, fluoride is swallowed, uh, most commonly uh, with fluoride water, um, and then also some fluoride toothpaste uh, that's swallowed from the younger children, then it's incorporated into the developing enamel of the permanent teeth. But it's the topical benefit each and every time we sip on the fluoride uh, uh, water that's the, the most helpful. And then where are our primary sources? Well, there's fluoride toothpaste, water fluoridation, the fluoride varnish, which is a professional application of a very concentrated fluoride, or other forms of fluoride in the dental office, including gels and foams. And then uh, fluoride mouth rinses, but we don't really recommend that until the child is older and can safely uh, expectorate. Uh, and then uh, those are the topical benefits that includes the water fluoride. And then there's the systemic benefits, which is both swallowed toothpaste, younger than age three, um, and water fluoridation, and possibly supplementation, although that's not used near as much now. Again, uh, systemic fluoride, um, this is the fluoridated water systems. We, we love to have all of our water systems fluoridated. Um, typically, it's into the 0.7 to 1 million uh, parts. Um, and if they are on a public water supply, there's references that, they, that you can check to see if it's uh, fluoridated. Uh, bottled water, a lot of parents and families are now using the bottled waters. And we don't know which ones are fluoridated and which ones aren't. And so uh, I encourage them to use the city water system. But if they are on a bottled water, we definitely want to make sure that they're using a fluoride toothpaste as well. Um, and then if they're on well water, then there are certain areas in the state that actually have natural fluoride in it at, a, at, a, at an amount higher than what's recommended for fluorid, uh, uh, fluoridated water systems. And so uh, if that's the case and if you want to know, what, you know whether they're getting adequate fluoride, then you would have to test that. And um, that's 
really something that we've we've gotten away from uh, as much because of what we call the halo effect that I'll go over in a second as well as uh, the swallowed toothpaste in these very young children. So that leads me to this chart. Uh, we all see this chart when we're in dental school. Most pediatricians see it as well as if they're at this age and we've tested the water and it has this amount of fluoride in it, this is how much we want to give them. Well again if you'll remember the greatest benefit of fluoride is the topical benefit, not the systemic. And so this, these supplements are usually in a liquid or a tablet form. It's in the mouth one time and then it's swallowed. That's not the greatest benefit because if you just did that at the same time you brushed your teeth, you've, you've gotten the same, basically the same amount of fluoride on the teeth. And then you've got children under the age of three that we know swallow a certain percentage of the toothpaste that's used. So then how do you calculate? Then we have the, what's called the halo effect. A lot of um, uh, um, formulas are manufactured with fluoride water. So we don't know how much they're getting there. A lot of kids go to preschool and they're drinking water that's in a fluoridated system and then they go home to the well water. So um, even in the dental schools uh, now, they're really not emphasizing the supplementation so much as the fact that these very young children uh, uh, we want to make sure that they are getting two th key things. One, fluoride toothpaste, and the recommendation is now from the eruption of the very first tooth. But what we're talking about and what we teach, and we'll show it in just a little bit on the hygiene, is a smear up to about age two and a half or so. Just kind of rub it into the bristles and then no more than a small pea size after that. Because we want that topical benefit twice a day. And then we also want flu um, the fluoridated water, which gives the topical benefit, but we also want the professional applications. So if they're getting the professional applications in fluoride toothpaste, um, and even if they're on well water, um, generally not prescribing uh, the supplements. If I feel that that child needs more fluoride once they're in my dental home, then I'm going to prescribe a concentrated topical fluoride, not the systemic. Briefly, we need to touch on this because this is what everybody's worried about. This is what parents are worried about, and rightly so. Um, fluoride, uh, fluorosis is a staining, a speckling of the teeth. Sometimes you'll see brown pitting in most severe cases, um, what we call snow capping, that sort of thing. And um, we saw a lot of it in the past because just about every infant and toddler received, you know, trivifluor or another type of fluoride supplement um, from their pediatricians. And so then we started adding up, well, swallowed fluoride toothpaste, as much as 50% of what's used, plus the supplements, plus fluoridated water, and we started seeing a rise in fluorosis. Um, so now that we're getting rid of, uh, getting away from supplementation, unless we're doing just topical, um, and if they're in a fluoridated community basically and they're using fluoride toothpaste, we do not need the supplements. And when we are using a smear to a small pea size, the risk of fluorosis is very remote and I review that with parents. But you can incorporate your risk assessment as well and if they're high risk, you, regardless, you want the fluoride toothpaste. If they're extremely low risk and you know the parents are doing everything, if, if they really feel like they want to wait on fluoride toothpaste until they're two and a half or three, then I, I'll, I'll work with them on that, but I'll tell them if I start seeing any changes, we've got to get the fluoride toothpaste. In regards to toothbrushing, uh, I always explain to the parents, you don't want to chase a moving target. You've got to get the child where you can get the toothbrush where it needs to be, along the gum line, because we showed you where the where the toothpaste or where the plaque first forms is at the gum line along the margin. And as soon as you get the toothbrush in there, the head's going this way, the head's going this way, pulling back. Um, and that's natural. They, they fuss about it. And they fuss about, you know, if you won't let them play in the street uh, as well. And, and, and so you have to do those things is what I'm going over with the parents that you know to be the right thing to do. And I would rather they fuss about getting their teeth brushed than fussing because they've got a toothache. Um, so the lap position, if you have help, um, holding the hands here, laying in the lap, getting the lip up out of the way, brushing all along the gum lines, moving the cheeks out of the way. Uh, if you have to, get the open button and then brush behind the teeth. Um, this works great and, and for the younger ones, if, if they don't have help, single parents or um, you know, one of them's at work, then, I, then for the younger ones you can actually sit them in the lap and I describe sitting in the lap, having a washcloth and a toothbrush with you and holding their head against your shoulder and you can move their lips out of the way, cheeks out of the way, brush a few teeth, wipe their mouth out, brush a few more and you don't have to be near the sink and sitting over there and kind of doing the whole wrestling match. And then when they're old enough, you've got a good squeeze with the legs if you need to, you can wrap a towel around them, but the key is being able to visualize what you're doing and get into all surfaces of the tooth structure. How much toothpaste are we talking about? The first one is for the preschoolers and infants and from when the first tooth uh, erupts and so we're talking about a little dab and kind of rub it into the bristles. And then by you know two, two and a half years of age, we're talking a small pea size. Uh, thankfully, we're not seeing the toothpaste commercials we used to see where we saw the, the big you know, uh, Nike swoosh just about on the, on the toothbrush with the toothpaste. 
Uh, the technique, again, we, we're looking at, at back and forth and small circular patterns. I always review with the parents that you know, just one swipe across the tooth is not going to take care of it. And some, plaque, and some kids is a little more tenacious than others. So it's three or four passes on each and every tooth, both in the front and the back, behind and on the chewing surfaces of the tooth. In regards to the foods, I'm not a big fan of the lists of, well, we can have these and we can't have these because it, it's, it's very confusing at times and everything that's on the can have just about except maybe water and a couple of other things still have carbohydrates in them. The, the key aspects of this are the frequency, the number of times it's in the mouth, the duration, and what the sugars are. If, if, it's, a, if it's a complex carbohydrate versus a simple simple sugar, okay? And um, then there's certain types, categories, that I really emphasize to the parents to avoid and that pediatricians can do the same thing. It, can, it, it simplifies it because if you start getting them on a list, it just becomes a big blur to them. So what we want to try to do is just look at the patterns and what it is that we're consuming. We want to avoid, as we said, frequent snacking, particularly of things that are higher in sugars between meals. Um, we want to avoid frequent sipping, and that's the biggest problem that you're going to have as pediatricians uh, is seeing this use of the sippy cup like a pacifier. They fall down, they get upset, they get a cup. Uh, they're tired, they get a cup. Um, you know, they, for whatever reason, uh, we've gotten to the point where we're consuming these things all day long. So if it's water, that's fine. But every sip, again, we've got the exposures to the acid. So um, we want to emphasize between meals water and milk. Uh, and then if we get juice or something else, have that with the meal. So it's the timing that we do um, because if you add it at a meal, you already have the carbohydrates of the meal, so you're really not adding anything else. Um, and then staying away from the sticky and uh, types of foods that stay on the teeth for a long period of time because obviously it supplies the sugars for a more extensive period of time. Um, don't eat right before bed uh, and after the nighttime brushing and water only at nighttime. So the the stories that I give to the parents are th in regards to the diet is water only at nighttime, between meals water, occasionally white milk. If they have juice or something else, have it with a meal. And let's avoid two key things. Sour, because it means it's very high in acid and kids are popping Skittles in the mouth by the time they're one and a half or two years old. And it just, and I hate to hit just Skittles because it's any of those sour candies. Um, but anything that's sour is very high in acid, so it immediately starts to cause a demineralization of the tooth structure, weakens the tooth structure, then you have the acid release of the bacteria, and, and I'm seeing a significant increase in erosion and caries. So water only at night, water and milk between meals, if they have something else to drink, have it with a meal, avoid the sour, and avoid sticky. And if you do that, you don't have to give a whole list of, of, of types of meals. Um, again, this is from the Smiles for Life program, talking about pretty much what we've talked about, and avoiding the right before bedtime. Um, I don't see sweetened pacifiers too often anymore, but as they transition to a cup, we want to emphasize if they have something in the cup besides water, you sit down, you drink it, you, you're done with it, you go back to the water again. Um, uh, one of the things that we talk about is wolfers and gulpers versus sippers and nibblers. And, well, my son has got six cavities and my daughter never gets them and we have the same diet. And I said, well, is one of them a wolfer and a gulper? And they're like, what? I said, well, they eat it down really fast and they go do something else. Yeah, yeah, that's him, the one with no cavities. And how about the sipper and nibbler? Yeah, she's really picky. She's a little bit here, a little bit there. So it's the frequency again. So, um, you know, that's why we want to focus between meals as much as possible on water. Or if they do, or they're one of those more frequent eaters, they're kind of picky. Then, then really want to encourage water after that. Establishment of a dental home. This is the other key aspect of the four key components of prevention. Um, there are a lot of things that we do, much of what we've talked about already. We're going to reassess their family history. We're going to reassess their fluoride exposures. We're going to evaluate comprehensively their oral cavity, um, to find out susceptibilities, increased risk for developing decay, see if they already have decay, find out what the family history is re regarding decay, apply fluorides as appropriate, uh, particularly the varnish. Um, when they're old enough, start doing simple cleanings. When it's appropriate, take appropriate x-rays and provide what care needs to be done. But having a dental home, and this, this concept came really from the AAP's concept of the medical home. Um, it, you're, you're in one location, you come to know the care providers, those care providers uh, come to know you, uh, your child knows you. The worst thing for me is when I've got a three-year-old with a facial abscess coming in and they've never seen me before, or I have a six-year-old that's fallen off his bike and he's never been to a dentist before. That's not your first visit that you really want to have. Um, and it's not the first visit that a parent wants to have because they don't know who's taking care of their child. So if you've already established the relationship and the rapport and 
very importantly, we can take a child that's high risk and maintain them and not have them develop treatment needs. When I get a high risk child in and I see these demineralizations, we can remineralize them. We can get them to change the diet. We can get them to change the hygiene and may never actually have to treat them. Um, if they don't get into the dental home, then the likelihood of progression of disease is much higher. We're going to touch briefly on some other developmental issues that you as a pediatrician uh, deal with on a regular basis and questions you deal with. First of all, teething. Um, the training for, you know, in, you know, for pediatricians in teething tends to um, be very good these days from what I've spoken with, but you know, we have to reassure parents that if they have an extended high fever, it's not teething. If they have other types of significant illnesses, it's, it's not teething. Um, what they're going to typically see is an increase in salivary flow. They're going to see some fussiness during the time that those teeth are moving. Um, and, uh, you know, and, and just being, you know, uncomfortable. And one of the things that I review with them is some very interesting studies that have been done in that teeth move in spurts and we grow in spurts. And so quite often we'll have patterns of the, the child is very hungry for a while, they're really active, and then all of a sudden they're getting really agitated, they don't want to eat, and then boom, we've got a tooth in the next morning. Um, and, and so what I'll usually go over when the, the child is older, uh, five or six, and the parent's saying, yeah, they got this pain back here. I said, well, if it's, if it's teeth moving, it's usually going to be more in the evenings and nighttime when our growth hormone increases. And they go, yeah, 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 yeah. And then I said, it'll usually be in the area where we can anticipate a tooth coming in at the time. So... The, the children are going to go through some fussiness periods and some increased drooling, but if you've got high fevers and other types of problems going on, you need to get to the pediatrician to get evaluated. Um, things that make it feel better, um, coolness and pressure. And so I go over things like a cool teething ring, um, maybe kept in the refrigerator, not the freezer, cool, clean, moist washcloth, anything that they can put pressure on that area and coolness, it helps make them more comfortable. Um, acetaminophen, um, when they're old enough and if, it, and, and if they can take it, that can be helpful. We want to avoid topical gels, any of the topical anesthetics. Uh, for the very young children. It only lasts six to eight minutes. It doesn't get to the source of the pain primarily. Um, and it is now recommended by the AAP that, that no child under the age of two receive um, a, a topical anesthetic um, simply because of, of a, a rare uh, blood disorder that it can cause. Um, and this right here, sometimes I have parents come in panic that their child's got a tumor. And what we're seeing is what's called, a, it's a misnomer, it's not really a cyst, but it's called an eruption cyst, but really what it is is a hematoma. We have a tooth that's moving down, uh, a tooth, developing tooth is surrounded by a sac of tissue uh, until it comes through the, the gum tissue. And, and so while it's there, as they put pressure on it, they bite on something, it can cause a little bleeding internally in that little sac of tissue, and it clears up by itself as soon as the tooth erupts. In regards to non-nutritive sucking, kids are oral, uh, as you know, and it makes them feel better to have things in their mouth. When they're first learning about things, you know, they touch it and they taste it um, to see what it feels like. And so they, it, it helps them psychologically, it helps them with comfort, um, and very early on uh, we can expect that. Um, in regards to the pacifier, um, usually we're wanting to be out of that by two to two and a half mostly because we can start to see alterations in the bite pattern because the tongue is down, the cheeks are in, and long term that can cause a constriction of the upper arch and we end up in a lot of kids developing a V upper arch against a U lower arch and it doesn't match and so then they end up developing what's called a cross bite and they can't get their teeth together. Um, the flaring of the upper incisors is, uh, is, is more self-correctable, um, so if the habit is stopped before usually the second molars are in, then we'll start to see those upper front teeth kind of laying back and, and coming back down again. In regards to digits, I just reassure parents, um, and it's a little bit different what's on the slide, but it's pretty consistent with the studies. Until a child wants to stop, you're really not going to get them to stop. They will work around what you paint on, they'll work around mittens, they'll work around a whole lot of things. And the, the, the majority of the effect of the digit habit, whether it be fingers or thumbs, um, is in the anterior. Now, what I emphasize to the parents is ideally by the time we're about to lose baby teeth and get permanent teeth in, around five to six, well, most kids have stopped it by that time anyway. We can have the talk about them getting ready to be a big boy and big girl and start kindergarten. Um, you know, uh, and, and you know, you need to start having to talk with your thumb and there's some things that we can do later on to help but I'm not worried about a three-year-old sucking their thumb and you're really not going to be very successful in getting them to stop and a lot, there are some studies that show the more you harp on it the more they're going to do it 
Um, and so it's, it's, it's not a big, big problem. And you can, a lot of times parents can be reassured if it starts to decrease to what we call sleepy time, before bed, when they're, you know, when they're, when they're tired, uh, before nap time, then it's usually going to resolve itself when they're older. So the primary take-home messages for, for, for this oral health component is that early childhood caries develops through the interaction of bacteria, dietary sugars, and the teeth themselves. Um, and we need to do a risk factor and assess uh, the oral health and do a comprehensive exam. We need to talk about prevention through hygiene, fluoride, and we need to establish a dental home. Now, what we're going to do briefly is talk about the two specific programs in the state of Alabama that will reimburse um, uh, primary care physicians uh, that have received uh, certification in the training uh, for doing an initial oral health risk assessment exam and application of the fluoride varnish. We're very pleased to have this program. There's some other states that have had it for an extended period of time. North Carolina, I believe, was the first one to do this. And um, they have seen a dramatic increase in the, in the number of one-year-olds in the dental office um, and a decline in early childhood decay. I'm most proud of this program in Alabama because of its strong emphasis on um, getting to a dental office early. Um, and the fact that we have now seen several thousand uh, one and two year olds in the dental office at a much higher rate than we, we saw before this program was implemented. The program was first developed um, with Medicaid uh, called First Look and um, it was developed uh, through collaboration between uh, dentists, uh, Alabama Dental Association, uh, Alabama chapter of uh, AAP and Medicaid and it was implemented uh, in 2009. And uh, let's talk about the goals. The goals for this program, uh, and I was involved early on in its development, is we, first of all, wanted to improve the awareness of early childhood caries. Uh, the knowledge base out there on, on how bad it was um, uh, was not real high in a lot of uh, groups. Now, pediatricians in a lot of areas were well aware of it because they were coming to us all the time going, I've got some kids, we've really got to get into the dentist early because they're looking terrible. Um, so we wanted to increase the awareness for not only um, child health care providers and dentists, but also the lay uh, population. Um, we wanted to be able to provide an increased avenue of providing early intervention uh, and early education. We wanted to actually widen the provider base. Um, our our uh, intention and our hope was, and what we've subsequently seen, is the more pediatricians we have well trained on oral health, picking up the phone and calling their local, local dentist saying, hey, I've got a high-risk one-year-old that uh, has demineralization on the upper four incisors and I'd like for you to, you know, to accept this patient. The more we have that going on, the more we were going to see more dentists taking, taking these, early, uh, these children at an early age, and we are seeing an increase in that as well. Um, providing anticipatory guidance, as we talked about, uh, that was one of the key goals. Getting fluoride varnish, that was one, of, uh, one aspect of this that we wanted to incorporate into the program because we know that early application for high-risk children of a fluoride varnish, which is a very concentrated fluoride that sticks to the teeth and releases fluoride for several hours, can significantly reduce the chance of developing dental decay, particularly if it's done on a regular basis. And we wanted to get them into a dental home. So who's qualified to participate in this program? Well, first of all, and through Medicaid, you have to be a primary care provider uh, that is in the Patient First program. I'm not sure if that program is, name has changed since we've gone to the managed care system that we're developing, but um, basically you've got to be a, a primary care provider in the Patient First Program for Medicaid to be able to participate. You must successfully complete this training and to pass the post-test uh, at a level of at least 75%. Um, and um, the physician in your office must have certification of training before uh, they can bill. Um, you, can send, you can have your staff take this uh, training, uh, which I highly recommend. You can have um, uh, nurses uh, take this training as well, but they, in order for them to bill, the physician themselves has to re receive certification. What child qualifies? Well, first of all, this program is designed for the reimbursement is for, for six to 36 months of age. Um, so you can, you can do the comprehensive evaluation, you can build the code uh, between that range. Uh, they must have at least two high-risk factors, and as we talked about, one of those is they're, they're enrolled in Medicaid. The other is any of those other risk factors that you're going to find on the risk assessment tool that you're using. And once they have seen a dentist, they are no longer eligible. That doesn't mean that as, in, as part of your EPSDT, as part of your well-child checks, that you're not 
talking about oral health, that you're not looking and seeing how things are going, making sure they've seen a dentist. But your administrator, whoever's responsible in your office for doing this, must verify each and every time if that child has seen, received any form of dental service by a dentist uh, in the state. And if they have, then you can no longer apply the fluoride varnish and, and bill for it um, uh, or bill the code for the exam if you haven't done that yet. And again, it's the responsibility of the provider to check eligibility. And that is available online uh, as you uh, go to the Medicaid site. First look providers, once you've been certified, uh, are you going to bill for basically two codes. First of all, the 0145 code, the D0145 code has been, uh, it's originally a dental code, but it's also incorporated into the me medical um, aspect of Medicaid now. And that's a comprehensive oral exam of a child that's under the age of three and giving the counseling um, uh, and, and uh, instructions and, on prevention. Uh, and it can be billed one time, uh, and then a dental provider can also bill it one time, anywhere between the age of six and uh, 36 months. Then you can also uh, bill for the 1206, uh, topical application of a fluoride varnish. That can be done uh, only after you have done the 0145. Um, so the first time that you do this, you'll do the 0145 code and the 1206 uh, if they've determined to be high risk based on your risk assessment chart. And it can be applied up to three times, billed up to three times in a single calendar year, uh, no more than six before age 36 months. Now, hopefully by that time, they've already gotten to the dentist and you're not worried about that anymore. That's the goal. But there are some areas where it may be a little more challenging. And so each time you've determined them to be a high risk, you've made a referral, you've recommended that they get to the dentist. If they come back for a well child check, it's been more than 90 days. That's the other key. You can't apply it less than 90 days from the last time that you did it. And they still have not been to a dentist. And you still determine that they're high risk. You can reapply and rebuild the 1206 code. There are specific billing requirements. You cannot, one of the things we were trying to avoid is having a dental day uh, in the physician's office. Uh, if you want to have a day where you talk a lot about oral health, you know, and, have, and, and set up a whole thing, then that's fine. But you can't do that to bring in a bunch of kids, do oral exams, and apply fluoride varnish and bill for it. This, the whole idea is this is part of the overall EPSDT that you're doing, the overall uh, discussion and evaluation of the health of the child. And so it's done on well child checks uh, as they come in. Um, you and your administrator will, of course, understand these codes better than I. Um, but uh, the key is it's being done on uh, a new patient or established patient during well child checks that they're coming in as part of the EPSDT that you're still doing for the child. What do you have to have documented in your chart? Well, you have to have that you've given anticipatory guidance. You have to have that you've done a risk assessment. Um, you have to uh, put in there that you've done the counseling for the, for the parent and that you have made a referral to the dental home. Well, guess what? That one risk assessment tool that we showed you has every one of those little boxes on there. And that is available through the AAP, through aap.org. You can download that um, available online and through many different sources. And that's an, an, an ideal one you, to use. But there are pediatricians that are, you know, with their digital charting have, may have other ways that they can do that as well. But uh, I believe a lot of them are using that particular one. But those are the things that must be in your chart if you're billing these. Um, and referrals. Uh, once they've determined to be high risk, then you're obligated to refer them to a dental home, um, uh, particularly if you're going to apply the fluoride varnish and bill for that. And if you have trouble uh, finding a dentist in the area, then you can contact um, Medicaid and, and try to uh, and, and ask to speak to a first uh, care care coordinator. Uh, that can help you with a referral. Uh, I know several pediatricians that have typed up a list. They've contacted their dentist in the area saying, hey, will you take my one, two, and three-year-olds um, for evaluation? And, and what we emphasize with a lot of the dentists is you don't actually have to provide treatment if they don't need treatment. If, <clears throat> if you can maintain them and keep them from requiring treatment, then that's a huge help. And then if it's beyond the scope of your care and you feel like you need to refer to a specialist, then do that. But um, uh, so what they're doing, a lot of these pediatricians, are, they're, they're typing up a list. Here are the local dentists in the area that, that you can go to and give that to them when they give them the referral. And then ideally when they're coming back each time, ha we, I see here on this such and such date we referred you to a dental home. Have you been to the dentist? And you, of course you'll check in eligibility on the um, uh, website as well for Medicaid. And uh, here are the two uh, primary contacts if you have any questions in regards to uh, the Medicaid First Look program.
I'm going to skim through these very quickly uh, in that the program is almost identical for all kids now. Uh, again, the Medicaid program, first look, was implemented uh, beginning of 2009. Um, a couple years later, um, all kids um, moved forward with this plan as well. And our goal was to have everything dovetail together so that if you were already a first look provider, then once you sign up, you're an all kids provider. If you weren't seeing Medicaid, but you became certified as an all kids provider, then eventually you become a Medicaid provider, then you can do both. Um, and not having different documentation that you have to do in your charts and that sort of thing. Again, it's a, a fluoride varnishing uh, application and an assessment of the child by the pediatrician uh, that will begin in fall of 2011, modeled after a Medicaid program. Same benefits getting them ultimately to a dental home, uh, prevention at an early age. Who are qualified providers for all kids? Uh, it's limited to uh, all kids participants that are primary care physicians, uh, pediatricians, and I believe family practice physicians, um, but it's enrolled in the Blue Cross Blue Shield uh, PMD program. Um, they must be trained, you must receive this certification, uh, or complete this training and receive certification from all kids before you can participate. Um, again, the requirements are identical. Uh, participation in this web-based program, uh, scoring at least a 75 on the test uh, afterwards, and uh, then uh, apply for certification and receive that uh, certification. Uh, the guidelines um, for all kids, um, it is based on the reimbursement is based on their uh, dental fee uh, PPO uh, plan. Um, the Procedures must be done, again, in a routine visit, not on a uh, quote-unquote dental day or specific dental um, uh, issues. You're doing this as part of the overall uh, plan for the child in their regular routine visits. Um, they are filed uh, similarly with the same codes, 1206 and 0145. Um, and I'll let you guys work through with the administration on the encounter claims and that sort of thing. Um, Reimbursement guidelines are the identical. One time for the 0145 between 6 and 36 months of age, uh, up to three times a year, up to 36 months of age for the 1206, no closer than 90 days apart. Once they've seen the dentist, uh, then they are no longer participants in the program uh, for reimbursement. And the eligibility is identical as well. And if you file and you're denied, more than likely they've seen a dentist somewhere. And there's the program uh, contact for all kids. And that ends the uh, training uh, for this particular program and for um, uh, oral health risk assessment and fluoride varnish applications. I appreciate your time and your attention and the opportunity to do this. And um, again, there'll be some additional training through a video, and then you'll have the opportunity to take a post-test. Thank you very much.